Okay, folks, we're finally going to do it. I'm finally going to do the video, and you can all come here. I can point you to come here to talk about the basics, how to improvise on cello, how do you approach improvising on cello, how do you do it better on cello, and I'm going to keep the energy as high as possible so that even if you don't play cello, you're going to learn something about life if you watch this video. So come on, everybody, and I'm going to say this once. I'm going to say it clear, and then there are going to be no questions forever because you're just going to know how to improvise on cello. All right, now the first thing that we're going to have to do is something called a paradigm shift. Now, if you don't know what a paradigm is, it's something from philosophy, and it basically means how you see the world, okay? Now, this is the fundamental problem. Now, I'm, a, I'm making this video assuming that you already play cello or violin or something that is in the classical paradigm, okay? And that is what we need to break out of because, as you've probably noticed, trying to do the classical approach, which is to think note first, get really specific, these are the specific notes that are being played, to try to do that in the moment is impossible, okay? So that's not how improvisers are thinking. Improvisers are not thinking about music the same way that people who are playing written music are thinking about that. And even people who do both will switch their own paradigms, me included. When I'm practicing something that I actually want the notes to be exactly what they are, it's such a different experience from when I'm making it up myself. And I pr much prefer the latter. I can usually get a lot more technical proficiency across in the latter. And just generally, like, you know, when you're playing written music, your creativity is limited to, well, how do I like, you know, bring out the character of this, which can be great. But there's just a lot more freedom of expression when you can add to what's going on. All right, so what are we going to have to do so that we don't have to worry about what the pitches are, don't have to worry about intonation problems, and don't have to worry about really anything? Because guess what? When you're playing improvised music, the majority of the time, unless you're doing some seaside, whatever, rhythm. Almost all of the music that's not classical music, it is rhythm. You have to be on the rhythm first. Funk is an extreme example of this, but basically all popular music, every instrument is a percussive instrument, is a rhythm instrument. It's contributing to the rhythmic feel of what you're doing as a band or whatever you're doing. What I found is that when I'm trying to think about notes and phrasing and tongue and how to get up there, rhythm is just yet another of a tool set that you're trying to use among many, but you cannot ever fuck up the rhythm. That's when it falls apart. So how do we switch that? We have to abandon everything that's not rhythm. All right? Now, don't lose your heads. Okay, I'm here to help you. <laughs> this is not going to be so hard. In fact, I actually want to make this easier. All right, I'm not used to talking like this. Do I have any water? Guys, what is rhythm? All right? I'm, I want to bring us to science and physics right now. What is rhythm? That's right. Rhythm is the information derived from the fourth dimension that we live in. The time dimension on top of the three-dimensional space. Fundamentally, time is the progression that changes what is otherwise the unchanging space, okay? We had to go philosophical. This is coming back around to how to play cello. I promise, when we're thinking about our lives in time, what are the things that speak to us? It's things that happen at exact moments. That's how you know that things have significance time-wise, 
okay? There's ways that our ears react to certain sounds that are built into what makes music good. And one of those things is, a, it couldn't be a percussive, a consistent percussive rhythm could not just happen. If it happens, it has some significance. Something is trying to communicate it. So it's about the rhythm. As we're gonna to come to find when I talk about building shapes, building sort of an image as you're playing, it's really rhythm that underlies the primary factor that goes into what is the musical shape and character that you're playing. The rhythm is going to define so many things and articulation. Now, crucially, and I think this is a lot of the reason, so we've talked kind of conceptually, the physical reason why it is still kind of difficult to play with intentional time on the instrument is that it's relative. So every body part moves a little differently. So for example, the left hand is actually in contact with the strings. The right hand is only in contact with the strings via a medium, the medium of the bow. So you can imagine that we actually do have to like anticipate a little bit more with the right hand what's gonna happen rhythmically than we might have to exactly with the left hand where we have a very precise and fine motor control. That's the only thing once we're in position between us and the note that we wanna play. Okay, is there a plane going over? Rhythm, oh my God, rhythm. So how do we do it? With the, with the left hand, it's actually pretty straightforward. You are literally hitting the string every time you set your finger down. And any rhythm that you could imagine doing with your left hand generally, I don't care what the notes are right now. We're not thinking about that, okay? We're thinking about rhythm and setting our fingers down. What are gonna be the easiest rhythms for us to do? Probably ones where it's the same finger or it's the next finger. So we're gonna like those sort of things. So let's go to the bow. We're gonna come back to that in a second. How do we get rhythm from this guy? Okay, we're gonna we gotta go left and right. We're not we're not doing it exactly the same way. But listen, what we can think of is that there being a sort of crucial moment in a smiley face per note of the bow. That little moment. So we're not thinking about the hand. We're thinking about the cut deepest connection point and that needs to be timed with our internal perception of the time okay now we're gonna probably have to come back to that later but don't worry it's all a lot easier i promise you're gonna be improvising by the end of the day i i promise if you keep watching this video because it's it's accessible you know i'm not the fancy improvise that's what i said all right so we kind of have it with the right hand we can picture you know, if we were if we were a drummer, we'd be doing this, all right? Now, our arm's actually in almost the exact same position, but we have to move it in this a little bit silly way in order to get that rhythm, okay? Now, another way that we're gonna have rhythm is when we change bows, okay? Now, I just want to draw our attention to the most sort of percussive action that the right hand could take because we are talking about rhythm, but it is going to be you know, something too that just has to be like, oh, you're gonna impulse from your shoulder and move over. That brings me to a very crucial component of all of this, which is that posture is actually probably even more important than they teach you in classical music. But I don't want you to think about posture the way necessarily that they taught you in classical music, even though there is a lot that's correct to that. What I want you to think about is one, how symmetrical and stable is your body? Okay, you need a little bit of power to get your arms into the right position so that your hands can actually be relaxed. That's the trick to that, right? So you need also a way that you can seat the cello against you so that you are completely symmetrical and able to, with mere little core twisting or potentially bringing the shoulders forward so that your arms can come more forward. Those should be the only movements required to play every single note. So you can see, I actually have the cello a little bit more rotated than I think a lot of people do. And so that does change the angle here. You're already having to adjust that anyway. Just do it relax. It'll still be easy. What I kind of think about is that I'm looking towards this little point on the bridge. 
Amazing. All right, now you're going to be different. Your body's different, but you need to find what's the way that I can hold the cello and not be like hiding from the cello, all right? You need your body accessible to you, okay? Now, once, now I know this sounds like a lot of work, but once you've got your body accessible to you and you're able to move your arms, <laughs> set up a mirror, make sure that your arms are moving symmetrically. Let's bring them in here. What are the ways? Okay, so at the end there, we're getting basic, all right? My forearms, they're the only thing that change. I brought my arms in, my forearms go to slightly different places. Boom, 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 boom. Rhythm, all right? So here's how we then have to practice different musical ideas. So let's just start with a basic rhythm. We're gonna do quarter notes. Honestly, it's great to just practice that because you want to know what's actually pretty hard? It's just playing something with the same rhythm for like a long time. That's why those guys on the old like Bob Marley records got hired for the gig. They're not playing complex, but they're playing the right time every time. That's pretty hard. So you can start by just trying to actually hit what we intend to. Let's do it not bouncing. Now how does that change? Don't be tight. This is super easy. You're just moving your hand. Let it sit there. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. I'm not thinking about tone. Okay, I'm letting that come because there's natural friction here because I've set myself up to have a good posture. All I have to do is move my arm. All right? How we refine it is going to come through the musical portion, but we have to get to that. Let's finish talking about rhythm. So what I want you to do is start relating to musical ideas, melodic ideas in a, in a different way than you have. So what you want to start doing after you've, getting that, you've gotten that quarter note started is introduce the other fingers and don't worry about what scales they're a part of. Just do them on every string because that's going to be a pattern, anything that's the same finger in on every string, that's useful. So learn what that feels like. You can actually use it all the time. Let's just do open one. Now you might say, well, that's kind of boring. But what rhythm are we playing? We're just playing eighth notes, all right? The eighth notes are a little bit boring. But what if we were to do something like this? Then you're starting to, to chive, and I don't have to think about what notes I'm playing. I am listening, though, okay? So once you, once you just practice... What are all the open three? What are all the open two? What are all the open four? What about open one four? All right? Now, maybe it seems like I'm playing really quick, and that's great because that's the effect you want when you're playing stuff that's fast. But is it difficult conceptually? No, it's just a little bit of like a muscle memory thing that you have to train in order to actually do it evenly and coordinate the timing of the left and the right hands. But once you have that feeling down, and it'll always get better, it'll always get more rich, then you can let it be guided towards things that actually are super awesome for the chords you're playing. All right, so let's move on a little bit. Let's get into the conceptualization of music that needs to change. The paradigm shift that happens in your mind, not just at the instrument, all right? But to sum up, with the instrument, rethink your posture so that you have great control over everything. Rethink the instrument as being all about rhythm and just practice different rhythmic patterns so that that's your basis for where things are on the cello, all right? Now, with that, you, you cannot be thinking about notes per se the same way that you were. You have to be able to feel chord changes and to hear a line. Now, that is going to be something that takes about as long to learn as you could expect learning a language to take, because that's exactly what's happening when you're improvising, is you're speaking a language. So I feel like that is part of the stuff 
that people get hung up on because it's not just coming up with notes. It's coming up with notes that sound like a language that we're used to hearing. You actually have to learn that language. So if you want to learn how to speak jazz, then you got to watch all the videos that talk about just normal jazz improvisation. And I think that the best way to start is with Gary Burton's video, which I'll link below that. He really does just lay it out in the first hour, exactly the process to learn how to improvise and speak with jazz. With other styles, there's going to be different idioms. There's going to be different sentences. There's going to be different sentence structures. So you have to just get to know whatever music you want to actually play with and try out different rhythmic things that are going to match with it, right? Because that's what you really want to do when you're improvising is you want to add to the music and do something that's stylistic to what the music wants to, to, to present, right? So this is where a different relationship to listening comes in. There's really two things going on here. There's uh, using our hearing, which is a very fine tune and quick sense. And also, instead of thinking of our fingers as being the things that we can intentionally move with, well, I guess we also need to do that. They're also the things that we can feel the best with. So we have to really be aware of what the string feels like tactilely on the fingers. But if you're very aware, if you bring your awareness to the tactile feeling of playing and to what you're hearing, then your body's actually able to move faster than your brain to fix any problems. And you can just trust that you're going to play in tune because you're listening and you have the feedback response. The reason why it works like that is because it's kind of like pain. If you hear something you don't like, it is a little bit painful. And what do pain responses not have to do? They don't have to travel all the way to the brain first in order to get you to change what's going on because that would be too long. So if you touch something hot, it only has to get to your spine for you to have an instant reaction to remove your hand. That's why that happens. And I'm not a neuroscientist, so correct me if I'm oversimplifying, but this is something I've noticed with the improv of the cello is that you have to, if you, if you match the listening and the feedback, then you can actually just trust that you're going to be playing good things. Now, of course, you have to actually sit down and, and, and try different things and like record yourself. Oh, that's the, oh, that's the stuff that anybody else can tell you. I'm here to tell you how to do it with cello specifically. So here's basically what I'm picturing as I'm sat up at the cello. So I want to picture my posture to be good. And I want the posture being good, allowing my hands to be as relaxed as possible. Because when I get going, I can't really think about that. I'm, I'm, I am going to get more tense than I could in a perfect scenario where I'm my attention is only drawn to how relaxed my hands are. So that's something I'll do when I practice. But when I'm performing, I can't rely on that. So it has to be scaled back such that even when I'm a little bit tenser in the moment, I'm not, I'm going to be able to finish the piece, you know, otherwise I used to have this problem. I could, I could play, but it couldn't, couldn't last through the piece. So that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is what I just said about the hearing and the feedback responses. All right. That's crucial. So I kind of picture a space here and a space here. All right. Now what's next? The rhythmic and musical intention. Now this is where my mind likes to picture things with regards to music. If you picture a pattern, you know, it just kind of goes up like with the frequencies. Things can be bubbly, things can be uh, angular, things can be harsh, things can be um, prideful. You know, there can be very specific moods to like very specific things with what you're playing. That's what's fun about playing with stuff in the first place when it comes to music, all right? So you have to let those things just be able to come out. And I think the way to do that is through this relaxed listening engagement. So only play when you can have thought of the rhythmic idea beforehand, that you know what rhythm you're playing, all right? Because if, if not that, coordinations, it's not gonna work. And then just listen and feel and trust enough that your ear will guide you and iterate that process. So even from the very beginning, if you throw on like rhythm changes and you just tell yourself that you're going to do like open two, there's so many notes that are going to work for a B flat rhythm changes like that. Um, I'll try accompanying myself to this recording and uh, if it doesn't work, I'll cut it or do something else that's silly so that you guys don't know how, you know, 
much of a failure if things can turn out. All right, no, no, it's okay. So let's let's see. One, a two, a one, two, three, four. I was limiting my use of notes, so we're not going to get all the really specifically right notes. But do you see how it still works? Especially if you did that and then surrounded it with stuff that was a little bit more consonant and inside so that it really feels intentional that you're playing with those actual shapes and ideas as you're going along. So do you see how by doing this, you're reinforcing your own perception of musical ideas as completed shapes. It's no longer going backwards, all oh, these notes, what do they mean? And what are the chords? No, you can have a way of visualizing the different ideas, the different arpeggios. You know, in music, it's not so complex. Literally every scale, it's either gonna be really, I mean, like every single scale pretty much has just those two. Uh, what would you call them? They're just you know, three note little little things, but a major, or I guess there's also, yeah, obviously the major one, but like a major scale. You know, what if I were to not change strings? You would see how, how just, you know, simple this is. You know, they're just very small changes, right, in the percussive ability of the fingers. This is why you don't actually have to think about it too much, because you just have to think about the shapes and about your connection to the instrument. And, of course, becoming musically intelligent in all the normal ways that that entails, too. But again, I'm not talking about that in this video, so don't ask about that in this video. Please ask about that for another video, because I think we're about done with this video. But before we go, I want to leave you with one final little tidbit, which I have personally found very, very useful in basically eliminating all my articulation issues. But I don't know how much it makes sense to other people, but I'm going to try, okay? So usually because we're setting our fingers down and we're looking from here, it's easy to think of the cello's bass as being here, the base on which the tower of the notes is built and we get further and further away. But cello is actually turned around from what a violin is. In a violin, you're seeing it from the bridge and your hand comes closer to you to get the higher notes. And I think this is actually more accurate to the physics of the instrument because when, when you play even an, an open note, there are other parts of the string that are vibrating as well just not as loudly. The part up here and the part here, they're pinched by the nut in the bridge, so they, they, mostly it's just vibrating where I'm bowing it. But there's always another, there's always other pitches. Like when you have your finger down here, yeah, there's, a, there's an E, but there's also a less loud, like flat F or something. And that's true for every note. Right? So, so what does this mean? Well, it means thinking about What's between the nut and your finger doesn't really help you with thinking about what you're really doing, which is changing lengths of strings so that over time in the fourth dimension, you have an instrument that's basically all these strings of various length next to each other occurring at a certain rhythm. That's music, man, especially with the cello, which already has the strings. But you have to think about this. If your finger is here, you have to think about this. And somehow for me, that just really changes everything because both of my hands can gently be there for that little bit of string that is everything to the sound that's coming out of the cello at that moment. So anyway, I hope that this helps you guys get going with improvising. 
start, you know, restructuring your posture, get those rhythms going, and then just just start jamming, throw something on, get a play along track. There's infinite information on YouTube. Just just look up, but then use, you know, have this as your foundation. Anyway, let me know how you guys think about this stuff. I probably didn't explain it very well. I did this entire video completely off the cuff, and I'm sorry if there's any problems. Just, just ask and I'll, I'll try to explain it better. Anyway, thank you guys and my normal viewers for bearing with this, uh, I would say, pushed personality. It's not exactly not who I am, but it's not exactly who I am either. It's something in between for YouTube. Anyway, I should probably end the video at some point, but again, I didn't plan how to end the f That's good.